so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Anthony Bach. He's the professor of oncology at UW School of Medicine, adjunct professor in medical history and ethics at UW School of Medicine. He's the affiliate member of clinical research division for, uh, of, um, of the clinical research division at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Um, he, his medical um, practice is in um, GI oncology, doctor, um, director of the program in cancer communication at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and the Fred Hutch. And his primary um, research interests uh, are in doctor-patient communication and palliative care. And um, he's the principal investigator of the OncoTalk Communication Skills Training Program for UW Medical Oncology Fellows and is an investigator on other NIH-funded observational studies of doctor-patient communications about hope and information and prognosis in hematologic malignancies. He earned his degree, medical degree at Harvard, completed his internal medicine residency at UW. We were just saying that he was actually one of my residents. Um, he, was, he um, was a postdoc fellow in oncology at the UW at Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Thank you so much, Drs. Brentall and Chegg. Um, you know, if we're going to talk about cancer care and it's what it's like to uh, live with cancer, I thought there would be no better way for us to start than to talk to someone who is uh, dealing with it right now. So I have a special guest tonight whose name is George Austin. And George, would you like to come up and sit down, please? Thank you so much for coming yeah, tonight. I'm glad I could come. Which how about yeah, this that chair? Would be good. Okay. Great. And I am gonna get you this. And, and you know, as we um, we're getting ready for this. I thought it would be uh, wonderful if George would just introduce himself outside of the cancer, and then we'll, we'll have uh, some time to talk about his experience uh, dealing with the whole system. So I was wondering if you could start with sure. introducing yeah. yourself. Yeah. I'm uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. We lived there 45 years. Uh, I'll tell you in a bit how I, how I got out here. But I had a really interesting career in investment management. I started out in the mutual fund business long ago. Then I was with the State of Wisconsin Investment Board, which invests for all the teachers and public employees of Wisconsin. And I was director of investments for a foundation at the University of Wisconsin, University Research Foundation, for many years. And the last phase of my career, I worked with individuals. I had like 50 clients that I managed money for them. And so I kind of covered all the main bases of mutual funds, pension funds, uh, foundations and private practice with individual managers. So I found it a really, a, a really interesting career. Some ups and downs, obviously, in the stock market, but uh, we, uh, we persevered. Yeah. And that's important, but much more important is our family. Uh, my wife, Shirley here, my caretaker, my partner for 62 years, and we had raised this wonderful family. Uh, we have three that are medical doctors and a professor, college professor. And it happens that our son, David, can be with us here tonight. He's a pathologist. And our daughter and two of the granddaughters are over here somewhere. Okay, two of our, our daughter, Greta, who teaches at Puget Sound, and her two, two of her daughters are here. So two of our grandchildren out of our 10. We have 10 grandchildren scattered around. Uh, the four children, the two live right here. David's five blocks from the Green Lake Apartments where we're staying, and Greta's only about a mile away. And we have a daughter in Corvallis, Oregon, and we have another daughter in, she's an ophthalmologist in California, in Palo Alto. So we have, so thankful we raised a great family. Just a great family. And then the other thing which has been a part of our life all along is travel. We're birders. We've looked around the world. We've gone on trips for birds all over the world, as Tony knows. <laughs> and uh, also, lots of other wonderful trips to it. Well, like we've been to Italy five times. We had the privilege of traveling to all these incredible places in the world. Uh, my son and I were in Nepal many years ago. 
up near in, the, in near Everest in the Himalayas. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was able to go to Bhutan with a birding group, and a lot of other birding trips to South and Central America. Uh, so I had all these wonderful privileges of family, vocation, and travel. And we, we loved it all. Well, that is really wonderful, George. Um, and, and so turning, the th I think that gives everybody a terrific background uh, about you. And so, you know, can you think back now to um, when you first realized that you were um, going to be dealing with cancer? And yeah. what was that like? Yeah, it was in the fall of a year ago last fall. Uh, in September, I was, I guess that's the insidious thing about pancreatic. There's no warning a lot of times, right? Because in September, we had one of our birding trips. We were in the coast of New Brunswick and Maine. Good part of September looking for birds. I was healthy. We were hiked every day. We ate at the restaurants we wanted to go to. We had a great month. And then during October, year ago last October, I started to have trouble. I couldn't keep food down. Uh, I had more and more problems of that sort. And I uh, became really quite sick by the end of October. So in Madison, where we li we'd lived, uh, I had, a, had an endoscopy, endoscopy then in early November, a year ago, last November. And so it, found, it showed that this food was not getting from the stomach through the pylorus down to the intestine, not much of it. So I was, I basically I was on a flu fluid diet for the last couple weeks there. And then the tie into Seattle is that our daughter is a radiation oncologist. She worked here at the UW for many, many years. She knows Tony really well. And she and I talked about it, and Shirley and I talked about it. And our daughter said, we think Seattle's the place for you. So uh, they, we flew out here after the endoscopy. Uh, and our daughter had arranged all these things ahead of time. So the second day I was here, I had a stent put in the pylorus to open up that opening between the stomach and the intestine. So uh, she'd arranged all that so quickly because she knew all the right people. <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> and as I say, she's known Tony all that yeah. time. They've, they've been good friends. Uh, she went to private practice in Corvallis about, about six, seven years ago, something like that. But she was here so long, knows so many of the people here, and it's the place for me, believe me. It's a wonderful place. Just a so, great place. You know, can you uh, tell me about what kind of things flashed through your mind when you realized that you had cancer? Yeah, yeah, because uh, I spent my whole life active. Uh, I played tennis even that September when we weren't out east. Uh, and so I played tennis my whole life. We skied our whole life. We hiked our whole life. Perfect health. And then suddenly the roof fell in. And what hit me, of course, right away was that both of my parents had died from pancreatic. They were elderly. My mom was 83 and my dad was 90, actually. But then more recently, Shirley's sister died from pancreatic. So I had this background of knowing how deadly, how deadly this cancer is. And so I was in shock. There's no question about that. There's no and, and I thought, wow, you know. I know the odds are not very good <laughs> right away. Yeah, yeah. So, so what helped you pull through that? Well, what helped me pull through it was that the more I thought about it, uh, and I had these 82 years of wonderful life, that's more than most people get. And I'd done everything I wanted to do. In fact, we had another trip to Ecuador planned for Christmas time a year ago, and then of course I had to cancel that out. But we were just keeping going and wonderful trips and wonderful life. I loved the, my work, as I said. I loved our, so proud of our family with the 10 grandchildren, the four children. Uh, and I said, I've had a great life. Mm. Maybe it'll go on a while longer, but maybe it won't. Mm. Uh, and I, I, was, I kind of got philosophical, Tony. I mm. got sort of philosophical. I said, this has been a great life. Mm. It took a while to, to get to that, but I was thinking about that as soon as I found out, though. Really? So the film found out. Yeah. Well, and, and what I remember is how your family all stepped up to play the plate, and different people came to every visit with you, and it was a, it was a great amount of uh, yeah. loving support, and also very, uh, you know, thoughtful support. 
you know, like you, hope for the best and plan all. for the worst. You probably right? met them all, yeah, because it, the support was, support was unbelievable, and it still is. Like our son brought us here tonight, our daughter and our grandchildren are here tonight. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful privilege to have this family. You know, one of your treatments um, was a clinical trial yes. of a new medicine. Yes. And I was going to ask you, what was that like for you to think about that? Because I know, you know, we do a lot of research as part of the university, and I know that different people um, have worries about being on a clinical trial. I had absolutely no hesitation about going on an exper experimental drug. It was in phase three, this drug that you got me going on. And I said to myself, I will try anything that it could possibly help. And it's not going to hurt, you know. We went through that in detail. Uh, and so I had no hesitation at all to go to the experimental drug, which then we used for like six, seven months till last summer. Uh, I, we were, I was on the experimental drug until end of June last summer. And then we found nodule, nodule the CT scans found nodules. And so he switched me to another drug, which has been really very, very helpful, very helpful. And, and you know, what's your quality of life been like now? It's been good. Uh, we hike, we walk every day, except on infusion days. Uh, we've been back to Wisconsin three times last year to see birds, <laughs> but more important, to see our friends and our family, the family back there. And so, and the other point I wanted to make is that when I go back, I'm, I'm, I'm still on three volunteer boards back there. And so I've been able to go to the meetings of those boards back in Madison, Wisconsin. And when I can, which is a good part of the time, I can have conference calls with the committee that I'm, those committees that I'm on, these three volunteer groups that I still work with. So I think it's important to keep going, to keep involved in whatever you can be involved in. And I was, I was so fortunate I could go back as I said, three times last year, Shirley and I could. Mm -hmm. And so what, if you had uh, advice to give to somebody uh, in your situation, what kind of advice would you give them? I would say the advice I would give is that uh, you, uh, you hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. Because when I found out last you know, October, November, and I had the... Uh, biopsy when I got out here, so then we confirmed the cancer in November, November a year ago. We immediately said, what do we do to prepare for what probably is going to happen? And so we worked on our will, and we reworked our will, which took a while because we wanted to be also have was say to Washington, so I had to have an attorney, our attorney in Madison that we'd worked with, worked with one out here too, was to, to get our will and estate plan up to date. So that was the first thing that came to our mind, is this is something we got to get prepared for because we don't know how many months we got. Hmm. And I also had other things like our Medicare, Medicare supplement would, in Wisconsin would not apply out here. The plan was only in the Midwest. So I had to hustle around, find a new medical, Medicare supplement uh, program uh, to get going here because we didn't know what, we know the costs would be high on my treatments. We just still, how, how, and of course I'm in Medicare obviously, I was, as I said, I was 82 when I got the cancer notice, and now I'm almost 84. So uh, I was able to uh, find another Medicare supplement plan out here. And those were kind of two of the things that struck you right away that we got to take care of. Got to yeah. take care of these things. Well, you know, the reason that I think that's uh, your, your reaction is so interesting is because I think a lot of people think, um, you know, if I talk about the bad things that could happen, It'll, something bad will happen, or it'll be too scary, or something else. It'll be too hard to talk to my family. I mean, what's your reaction to that? Well, this, this is a tough guy, you know? <laughs> but he laid it right out for me. He, he said, here are the statistics. Uh, and in my heart, I said, I'm not going to, hopefully, I won't fit those statistics, but there they are. You know, so right off the bat, I was facing probability of, uh, Maybe not too long to live, but here I am, a year and a half later. That's right, <laughs> having beaten but all I, the odds. But I appreciated that you were very, hmm. actually blunt, I would say, almost <laughs> about you know, because you told me what the odds are. Yeah. And, uh, and a few of us are outliers, that's what you've called me, 
Uh, I'm an outlier so far. Yeah. And so what are you planning for now, George? What's on the, what's well, on the agenda? I bet you can guess some. I know there are a couple planning. of important things. The migration. There's <laughs> <laughs> a big migration, of course, in the spring through the Midwest. We love these little warblers, so about this big. I think we showed Tony a few pictures of them. And we have 35 species that come through there, most of them on their way to Canada in mid-May. So last year we were back for that. We plan to get back for that this year. Uh, the fall migration coming the other direction is so usually mid-September and they're going to Mexico and on south. So birding trips still at the top of our list, I'd say. And I seem to remember there were a couple of other things on the list for this coming up in the spring here. Yeah, I, well, know the word, I know the warblers are really important. <laughs> 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 we have uh, our first granddaughter is finishing medical, our oldest granddaughter is finishing medical school here in late May. Two weeks later, she's getting married. And in the meantime, <laughs> this is our oldest daughter, the one's now in Corvallis. And her brother is graduating five days different from her graduation from his undergrad at Puget Sound. So we got two graduations and a wedding coming up in May, early June. So, so there's a lot we're pretty excited for. about that. Yeah. yeah. So George, thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to let you go back to the back to sit. But thank you so much for being with us. Well, so you know, I think that is a fantastic uh, set of lessons from. Uh, from George, and so thank you, George, and to your family for uh, bequeathing all of that on us. Because, you know, as I look at what happens with cancer care, I mean, certainly there's something really important about the medicines, and yet there's also something really important about what we do as uh, doctors and other clinicians, nurses, psychologists, the whole team, to help people face um, what's really a, a life-threatening illness. And, and you can see there are many people that we see, like George, who have you know, a, a fair amount of personal experience with cancer. And so it's not even like they need all the statistics from us. But this is all something that's in the uh, process of changing um, in cancer care now. I mean, there's the old way doctors talked, and um, my uh, example for that is kind of Marcus Welby. You know, you go in, they t he tells you, you do it, and, and if you don't do it, you don't tell him. And, uh, Coincidentally, all the people in this photograph are men. And you can just see there's a way in which uh, medicine has needed to change in a bunch of ways, like who gives it, the way we talk, and what we talk about. And, and those are some of the things that I'm going to try and illustrate today. Um, you know, we give a lot of inadvertent messages right here. <laughs> here. The guy is checking in, the woman hands him the thing and says, fill out this tag and attach it to your big toe. I mean, this is a way in which we give messages all the time in hospitals that aren't necessarily uh, what I would call healing messages. Um, so, you know, what is it that we should be doing? You know, what I wanted to give you all a taste of tonight is, you know, what some of the research says about how doctors talk and about how we all talk about illness. Because what the research is telling us now is that that old way doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a couple of big reasons. The first one is um, physicians, like many other clinicians, don't always know whether they're doing a good job about this. So this is a study that we did here at the University of Washington. Every dot there is an internal medicine resident. And we had the doctors rate themselves about how good they think they are at communicating along the bottom line. And along the vertical line, we asked their patients to rate them about how well they communicated. And you can see the way the uh, doctors rate themselves and the way the patients rate them doesn't correlate very well. And, it, and it's a curious thing. I mean, there are some bright spots there. You know, there's the guy down way at the bottom left who's not very good and who's really honest, right? But <laughs> really, really, you, I would be surprised if, if in other parts of medicine there was so much, uh, you know, uncorrelation between how doctors think they're doing and how they actually do. Um, and it turns out most patients want a lot of information. Right, so, so the question is, and there's this mantra out there, more and more and more information, we should be just giving more information. 
And what I'm going to say here is what the research is telling us is that just giving information isn't everything. And so here's uh, an example of this. We asked people coming to the Hutch, and uh, we did this study with a group in Boston and Dana Farber about um, how, how you rated, if you were a cancer patient, your chance of being cured. And you can see that 70% of the patients really overestimated their chances of being cured by quite a bit. Uh, only 3% of the patients underestimated their chances of being cured. And when we say overestimate or underestimate, we mean they're overestimating or underestimating by more than 20%, you know, a big chunk. This, we weren't asking them to be incredibly precise. You know, and, and this, is a lot of, this is a lot of discordance. I mean, if you look at this and you think about the kinds of decisions that George was making with his family, I mean, actually not understanding where you are is, is kind of a problem. The, the compounding this problem is the fact that the patient, the physicians think the patient got it. So we asked the, the physicians who took care of these patients how well they thought the patient understood what was going on, and the physician said, good, very good, or excellent, 84% of the time. So 84% of these uh, physicians thought their patient got it, 70% of the patients were radically overestimating their chance of being cured, right? So, you know, that's kind of a problem. Because you would think, you know, just from the purely rational point of view, you know, wouldn't it be better and shouldn't it be the case that if the doctor says the number of what your chance of being cured is, that you would get it, right? Well, it turns out that's not true. Uh, so 40 physicians, these are famous cancer specialists in Boston and Seattle, 236 patients who had a blood cancer. 88% of those patients wanted a number when they went into their visit with a doctor. 64 of the visits involved the physician giving a number because we audio recorded the, uh, the visits and listened to them. But giving the number didn't mean that the patient was more likely to get it, right? Ooh. What's happening? Well, here's an example. So this is the doctor talking to the patient about prognosis because we are trying to figure out, you know, how do doctors talk about this? What do they say? So the doctor is going on. If you had 100 people, the survival curve drops down because people die of one thing or another, including relapse. That's how the doctor says you could die if the cancer comes back. That tends to level off at about 2.5 years after transplant and stays level after that. It's about 30% in your situation. So, uh, you know, on the face of it, this, is, this doctor is trying to tell the exact truth, but it's a kind of a technical way of talking about this, right? And what the doctor is doing is describing the statistical way that we talk about um, how many patients get cured, and so he's looking at a graph like this. He's describing this graph, and he's describing the 30%, and he's saying precisely the right thing, right? But what does the patient take away from this? Before the visit, the patient thought their chance of being cured was 90 to 100 percent, right? They're coming to us because, you know, we're, the, we're gonna do the miracle cure. And after that, remember the doctor said 30 percent? The patient said, right after the visit, we had them fill out another questionnaire that says, now what's your chance of being cured? And the patient said the exact same thing, 90 to 100 percent, right? This patient didn't get it, even though the doctor said the exact number, right? So what's happening? Well, two weeks later, we have this research interviewer call up the patient at home and talk to them on the phone, and here's what the, pa here's what the patient said. After he, the doctor, said the 30%, he just kept dinging along in his facts, and I was stunned. Literally, my note-taking was completely done. All I wrote was 30% the rest of the time all over my paper. And I mean, I just couldn't get past that point. I don't know how to describe it. You know, if you, if you think back to just here, when we were talking to George, he said something like the same thing in the beginning, like that he was really shocked and a little stunned. And I think this is actually the norm, not the exception. And we see this over and over and over again, and I see it in people who come to see me for second opinion, and I see it happen in my own office. I can see, you know, see what happens when people are getting news that is honestly news that no one would want to hear, and their brains just get kind of flooded, and they just don't take it in. And I think this is where we as physicians need to have a more sophisticated set of skills to know when patients are getting it and when they're not. 
Uh, here, like another example. It could be one of those things that crawls into your ear and lays eggs, and the eggs hatch, and they burrow into your brain. No, nope, it looks fine. Right? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is like a little example of too much information. And yet, what we hear over and over again is most patients want to share these decisions. When I walk into one of these rooms and look at a patient who's dealing with something serious, what I know is the vast majority of them, like George, they want to have a hand in what's going to happen with them, right? Most patients dread getting bad news, even though they know it's really important. And what we have to do as physicians is get over kind of the social awkwardness of talking about really serious prognoses. Because it's pretty clear that where doctors and patients agree is that better communication is needed. Right. I mean, here's one kind of research example of what kind of difference better communication makes. Because, you know, uh, you know, George was talking about some pretty tough conversations that he had with his family and with me. And I think one of the big questions that comes up is, is that really worth it, right? I mean, I have patients and patients' families especially who ask me all the time, is it really worth talking about something that sounds this bad because it, you know, are we going to be harming this patient? Wouldn't it be better just let them go along their merry way and not know? Well, here's why it matters. This was a study that was done across the country in the United States. These were telephone surveys done from a group in Boston. They uh, had 300 some patients with metastatic cancer and they uh, were interviewed and one of the questions was, have you and your doctor discussed any particular wishes about the care you would want to receive if you were dying, right? And all the, the question registered was, yes, I've done it, no, I haven't done it. I mean, the researchers didn't actually collect any information about what the patients talked about. But they compared the patients who said, yes, I've had a conversation, to the patients who said, no, I've never had a conversation. And actually, the patients who said, yes, I've had a conversation, they weren't more distressed and they weren't more depressed than the patients who said no. They were much more likely to uh, accept that their illness was going to result in, the end of, in, in, the, in ending their life at some point, that it would be terminal. They were much more likely to want to know their life expectancy. So, so what I see here is that there is this progression of you know, starting to think about this, uh, starting to accept what's happening, and then wanting to know some more details, right? And that's a little bit about what you heard in this story, I think. It's not just a matter of what they know and how they feel, too. I mean, these decisions correlated with the kind of medical treatments these patients got in the last week of life. Patients who said, yes, I've had some kind of discussion, were way less likely to be in the intensive care unit and die there. They were way less likely to be on a mechanical ventilator, which w ended up not extending their life. They were way less likely to have CPR, which in this set of patients almost never results in leaving the hospital. And they were more likely to be in outpatient hospice at home for more than a week. And it's th the other issue here, and the reason this family thing comes up from Georgia's story is so interesting, is that it's not just an effect on the patient. There's effect, an effect on the whole social network around that patient. So the conversations that any of you have with your friends about these kinds of issues, even when they're tough, they're incredibly powerful, and they have ripples beyond the, peop the person that you're talking to. So that when they, in this study, interviewed the patient's spouse four months after the patient died, the spouse was more likely to have a better quality of life, they were more likely to say they felt prepared for the patient's death, and they were less likely to say that they had any regrets, right? And you know, you can hear from George's story. I mean, it'll, I mean clearly there's a lot of worry and, and some sadness there, but boy, he's done a lot of things to talk about, even, even now, and, and he's still doing them. One study even shows that having these kinds of conversations and making decisions about them actually improves um, how long people live uh, at the end of life. This was a study of patients with metastatic lung cancer, lung cancer that had spread to other parts of the body, and they compared patients who had had an early palliative care set of treatments where people had uh, parts of these conversations over time to people who had regular care. So it, it, what, what's happening and what oncologists do is really changing. And it's not just changing because of this um, 
research, right? I mean, this is part of a thing, and, and of course, the way we talk about cancer, I think, is changing. But it's also changing because the way you all uh, think about cancer is changing, and <laughs> it's because of this. It's because when someone comes to see me now in clinic, they've already read all about their cancer in, on the internet. And in some sense, my job with them has really changed, right? They're not only reading what the experts say, they're reading what other patients say, right? So this is this website, Patients Like Me, and what this survey showed is that the vast majority of people who are seeking health information on the internet are willing to share their health data with other people so that they can find out what to do better, right? That is what's happening all over the place, and it means what doctors do has totally changed. So it's not about me just explaining what the treatments are for the cancer. I mean, I, I definitely need to do some of that, but what I also need to do is really help individualize my treatment choices for a patient, help them make wise decisions, and talk to them about what living with the cancer could be like so that they can decide what really is the best way for them. And what I would say is that this is a new way of talking about what happens with cancer and the way that all of us, including you in this room, can help move this kind of uh, conversation forward. So the new way of talking about cancer, it's not just hearing from the doctor what you have to do, it's starting a dialogue about you know, what your choices are and how you can live with cancer. And, and when I see a picture like this, this is Leroy Sievers, who was the blogger on NPR who, who blogged about his cancer uh, a few years ago in a very public way about every visit with his doctor, I mean, you can see that there is a sea change happening in what happens um, in these conversations. You know, how, how would we get to better? I mean, because one of the questions is, is, you know, doctors are doctors, patients are patients. Is, it, is there something that you can really do to make constructive change in this situation? Because, you know, as you probably can guess, doctors are not the quickest people to, like, try and change themselves. And what they're doing is this thing that we call broadcasting, right? The, he did most of the talking. He started running it down to us. There was some material that was quite shocking. And, you know, there are ways to change what happens from the, the conversation on the left, which where the blue box is the patient, which is a bigger bubble than the doctor, showing that there's more going on there, uh, from the conversation on the right, which is the more doctor-dominated uh, conference. And I've been working in these kinds of techniques for a long time with uh, funding from the National Cancer Institute to d devise ways of engaging physicians in learning to do better. And the metaphor that I give them is that it's like skiing. You learn at the beginning, you have to learn some new skills to get to the next level, and you have to new learn a whole new set of skills to the next level. And it's not something you can read in a book. It's something that ha you have to do and practice and get on the slopes and try out. And you need to get feedback from someone who's better than you are so that you can actually figure out how, your, uh, how what you need to do improves. And so when it's your turn, you need to get a skill, try it out, see how you're doing, brainstorm alternatives. There's a whole learning cycle of things that happen there. And it turns out that if you do this, doctors really do change their behavior and their patients rate them uh, with more trust. So it, it, this is not just a matter of being nice, it's a matter of developing more trust in this relationship and making uh, better decisions. You know, and we showed even in that group of internal medicine residents that you see that you can, for example, uh, do way better after a short uh, set of workshops with residents about how they assess how much a patient understands, uh, whether or not they can listen for 10 seconds after they give bad news. I know 10 seconds is not very long, but that's what we could measure, right? So that's what we did. Whether or not they could see what kind of emotion was happening, whether they could give any kind of statement about uh, respect for what patients do to try and um, cope or get through a difficult situation. And this kind of training is w what I'd say could transform the way we conduct medical visits uh, for patients with cancer. From the litany of you've got to do this, 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 to you know what it means to make smart choices, what it means to live fully, what it means to take charge of your cancer. Um, and if any of you are interested, I made a set of videos with the uh, National Cancer Institute that are on their webpage about prognosis that, that illustrate um, with some real people how they, uh, in a way, do what George is doing, living with their cancer, making smart choices, living their lives. 
not um, just sticking their heads in the sand. And it's a different way of, of dealing with cancer than I think has often been discussed in public. So the other thing about this that would make things look better is if there were uh, teams in hospitals that helped patients and families have these discussions about quality of life. So I am the co-director of a center here at the University of Washington. That is the UW Center of Excellence in Palliative Care. We are working with the medical school, with the residency programs to change education. We are doing research on what really helps patients like George and his family. And then we're um, uh, working directly with the community in a bunch of different ways. And, it, and if any of you are interested on being a community advisor for us, you could come down here at the end and I'll give you a brochure of uh, something to think about because we are looking for community input. Because um, what we have learned is there's no substitute for hearing from, the, there's no substitute for hearing from people like you. A couple of things we're working on, I just thought I'd give you a couple of examples. An easy way to get ready for a visit with a doctor, we give you uh, a questionnaire beforehand, we feed back some of the critical uh, results for you, you take the form into your doctor's visit to help remind both you and the doctor of what are some of the important decisions that are coming up. You know, is there something you can do now? Well, yeah, there is. One is, you know, whether or not you're a person who uh, is living with cancer or just a person who is part of the social network of someone with cancer, you can help that person set their sights on what's really important. And sometimes it's hard to remember in the busyness and the complicatedness of, of cancer treatments. So setting your sights on what's important for you, uh, there's no substitute for this. And it's, and it's a little hard, it can be a little awkward. But it takes someone who realizes that getting through what can be an awkward conversation really has a silver lining to get to the place where it really helps someone make uh, wise decisions. And you know, think of these conversations as a first draft. You know, I, I often he hear from patients that they haven't done this because they're not ready or they don't know exactly how much, what to say, or they, ha they feel like they haven't figured it all out. And it, it turns out you don't have to have it all figured out. And that even having a little bit is actually tremendously helpful and, and tremendously freeing. Um, this is the work, some of the photographs I've been showing you have been the work of a photographer named uh, Nancy Borowitz, and this is uh, an envelope that her father wrote, um, and he also had pancreatic cancer. Open after I died, but before my funeral. Right? He had everything spelled out. Um, and, and this is uh, Mr. Borowitz and his wife. And then finally, um, Here's George looking at birds at Green Lake. <laughs> and he's been giving me, you know, little lessons in warblers. And I think I'm almost to the point where I could recognize a warbler if one, you know, hit me in the face or something. <laughs> anyway, um, and that's his wife, Shirley, of course. Uh, and of course, so we've, if you're interested in our work, uh, we've written a book. Uh, I have an iTunes uh, iPhone app for clinicians and learners. And we've actually launched a nonprofit to do some of this work in a national way. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I have a little time for questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, when I had cancer, my dad went with me to my doctor's visit, and I, I said, um, Doc, how long do you think I have? And my father said, that's a very awkward question. I said, look, if I only got a couple of weeks, I'm not going to vacuum. <laughs> you can imagine, 24 years later, the floor is dirty. <laughs> All right, now, that was a great talk. Who has a question for Dr. Bach? And if you have any questions, if you could come out, there's oh, yeah, some microphones, microphones on either side of the room. Come on up and uh, please. Oh, thank you for asking the, the first question. Hi. <laughs> Um, there's a couple of us here that work as medical interpreters in the hospital. Yes. And so my question would be, because I've been present in a number of um, conversations where there's cultural issues that arise, and um, is any of your research incorporating dealing with people who don't speak English and come from different backgrounds? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, there are, there is a little bit of research about people who don't speak English and come from different backgrounds. And, <laughs> and you know, I think the thing that I've learned about that is that there are pr some pretty huge differences about how different cultures deal with this kind of issue. I, I would say the myth that I've taken away from looking at this and being part of the research is um, there are, there's some, there, there's this kind of wooden nickel advice out there that there are cultures who don't want to talk about this at all or that, that they feel it'll be harmful for them. And actually what I have found is that all cultures talk about it in some way. And the question is, is can you figure out, you know, what's the way in which they uh, talk about this? So the question I often ask is, um, you know, if your family uh, needs to talk about something serious, you know, how would they talk about it? But I think you're right that it's a huge challenge for us in these kinds of medical centers about, about, about how to do that. And, and um, you know, there aren't simple rules is I think part of the other issue. Yeah, we all have to learn more about each other. Yeah, we have at least, at least 160 interpreter assisted appointments every yeah. day just here. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge challenge for yeah. us, yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, could you make some comments about diet, in particular protein? I've been reading about some things for people in middle age should lessen the amount of protein and people over say 65, 66 should increase their protein intake. Could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, there's a, a huge amount of uh, stuff going on in terms of diet and cancer. And if you look on the internet, diet and cancer is like one of the biggest things there is. And, and here's what I can say, and, and this is where I think the recommendations for exactly how much protein do differ from in, in terms of different diseases. I'm not sure I could say that there is a blanket recommendation about uh, protein specifically for people with cancer. You know, we are definitely uh, working with nutritionists in our clinic to make sure that people get uh, a balanced uh, amount of proteins, vitamins, minerals, things like that. But, uh, you know, this isn't something where I, I can say that there's one big thing out there. You know, I wish it were that simple, and I feel like one of the things that's happening out there is there's a little bit of oversimplification on the internet in terms of, you know, what really makes a difference. Um, so what I can say is I think uh, good nutrition is really important. We track it in a bunch of different ways with nutritionists, and I think that is critical. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Well, thank you for talking about this interesting subject. I have an observation about child life specialists yes. for pediatric patients, and I wondered if you could, you know, if you've thought about how that role for kids isn't really currently available in um, in inpatient or yeah. SCCA's care, and whether you know that kind of role would be something that would help family members. Um, yeah. across well, the so spectrum. yeah, so um, uh, the question is about a child life specialist, and if you don't know if um, if you haven't run into that in your own uh, experience, a child life specialist is someone who's a specialist at talking to children, especially younger children, and and I think the reason that is so important is because. Um, uh, when I talk to parents um, who are patients, I mean, one of their top concerns is invariably, what do I tell my children? How do I talk to them? How much should they know? How much um, would it be good for them to know? And I think those are incredible, both incredibly important and really important to individualize. Um, and if you look at their, the studies about what happens to children who grow up, after their parent has had cancer, I mean, they're big psychological, they're big psychological sequelae of it. So, I think it's one of the things that we we are just starting to realize how big it is, and um, and yet, uh, I think there's some things that we can really do with children that enable them to grow up as resilient, you know, emotionally <laughs> capable adults. And um, actually, the, the the knowledge is out there, and we need to do more of it. Thank Thanks. you for that question. Yes, uh, the question of diet came up a few minutes ago. Yeah. At least uh, around 2005, I was hearing from the radiation oncologists that if you're getting radiation therapy, you don't want a diet that's high in antioxidants because the antioxidants will absorb the radiation that you're using. 
for treating the cancer? Is that thought, is that still the thought? Yeah, good question. So you know what, uh, the question is about whether or not mega doses or, or very big doses of antioxidants could actually do something that you don't want when you're getting cancer treatment. And you know what, I'm not sure we have the final answer on that. I, I do think that both the, the medical oncologists like me and radiation oncologists, uh, we both recommend that people not take mega doses of antioxidants because it's not clear that they, uh, they help and there is this worry that they might undo some of the effect that we're trying to do. But uh, you know what, to be honest, the, the research that's out there is a little scanty. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if I have a big, I don't know if I have something more clear to tell you. At this point. I was uh, I was actually told that even the antioxidants in a normally healthy diet are a problem. Now, fortunately, I didn't need radiation treatment, as it turned uh, out. Yeah. But I was told if I did, the antioxidants in, in, in my diet would ha I'm uh, on a health food diet, and that would have to go. Yeah. Because the antioxidants in a standard diet are a problem. As I say, this was 2005. Yeah. You know, uh, this is one of those things where I would be, you know, if you were in my clinic, I'd say, well, gee, let's have you talk to the nutritionist and see what you're really eating, and let's sit down with that and try and give you a kind of an individualized recommendation. But it's a tough one. It's an it's a unanswered big question. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Ezekiel Emanuel was on the radio on my way here, so oh, I'm yeah. thinking about the Affordable Care Act, and yeah. he's very optimistic that it's changing the landscape of the practice of medicine, and I'm wondering if you have any comments on um, the ACA and its impact, either positive or negative, on palliative care and hospice care. Oh, yeah, so um, the Affordable Care Act. I mean, I think one of the um, things about the Affordable Care Act that might help us improve uh, care for complicated conditions like cancer overall is that it readjusts the focus of health systems to what does the person need for everything through the trajectory of their care. And so I think in that way, it can help us kind of put things in perspective in a really good way. And so I, I think that might help us rebalance a little bit how we think about um, important services for people with cancer. Um, you know, currently um, reimbursement is really skewed towards uh, paying for treatments like chemotherapy and imaging studies like, um, you know, MRIs. And while those are critical, um, you know, when you talk to people like George, you hear that there's, there are a whole bunch of things involved there. And I, I think we as a, a society need to have a talk about, you know, how do we make those big priorities? So uh, I think that's a way in which I think it could be helpful. Yes. You talked about having those difficult conversations. Yeah. How do you start those? And oh, yeah, how, yeah. if you're a family member or friend of someone, how do you start those or how do you support them in that? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Thank you for answering that. So starting a difficult conversation, one is get yourself ready. You know, pick a time when you're both, uh, when, when you're both not rushed. I mean, I think a really great place to do it is like some place like a kitchen table. That's a place that's familiar to both of you. You know, pick one thing that you want to find out about. And if you're somebody who's going in there uh, who wants to be of service and help somebody who's living with cancer, think about this as an opportunity to understand more deeply what someone is um, living with. Because if you understand them more deeply, it's more likely that they will come to the the idea of the best thing to do while you're talking. And what you do in this will be to create kind of a conversation where you know someone can talk about anything, even something that's kind of awkward. And um, the thing to watch out for, and this is the other big tip, is that there is this thing about emotion and what happens when people start to feel awkward or get sad or get anxious. And I think what you want to do there is Show them by the way you are that um, a little sadness, a little worry, a little awkwardness is okay, um, and that you'll be able to sit through it. And the more that you can sit through it, the more they will be able to reflect more deeply into themselves. So one of the things we're always teaching um, young doctors and doctors that we're working with is 
watching those emotion cues to see what the temperature of the conversation is. So for example, if you went back to that example where the guy said that 30% and the woman and the patient said, I'm not, I didn't get anything, you know what the doctor missed is she wasn't getting anything. And so he kept explaining, he felt like he was trying to do a great job. Uh, actually, he ended up spending a lot of time that wasn't really, didn't really help her. Right, and so I think that's the same thing. So everyone can tolerate turning up the temperature of the conversation some, but obviously, you know, you, you don't want to push him over the top. The goal of the conversation isn't, be, isn't necessarily to get to a certain answer, because sometimes people start these conversations and, you know, tell me what you want to do when you die, and they're like, oh, I can't even think about that, and they're like, no, tell me, tell me, and I'm like, you know, you don't have to do that. Uh, just the fact that you were interested enough to ask is, um, uh, a huge act of friendship and, and really love. So. Well, thank you, Dr. Bach. <laughs>